What's going on, ladies and gentlemen? Welcome back. I hope everybody's doing well. Today's episode is going to be brought to you by Mystery Ranch, built for the mission. And if you haven't been rocking a Mystery Ranch backpack on the fire line, well, you're doing it wrong. But in addition to the best build, the most comfortable, and the finest Fireline backpacks in the Wildland Fire game. Well, they make a ton of other stuff. So, if you want to get all of your load bearing load blah, blah, load bearing essentials all dialed in, well, swing over to www.mysteryranch.com. And while you're over there, check this out. You're gonna have to look for the Urban Assault Twenty One and the Three Way Briefcase, both in Wildfire Black. Why? Well, I'm sure you've heard of the Backbone series. Um, yeah. A portion of the proceeds of these sales of these packs, the uh, Urban Assault 21 and the three-way briefcase, well, those actually uh, go, a little bit of those funds might go back to you. Yeah, so if you haven't checked out the Backbone series, well, now's your opportunity to do it. It is a collection of stories of folks in the field that are going above and beyond in the line of duty and after duty, even in the off season, to get themselves better, to do uh, education, to do whatever they need to do to further their career and their stories being told while doing it. It's pretty awesome. So if you guys want to go over there and check out the backbone series, go over to www.mysteryranch.com and check it all out. It is awesome. Oh yeah. I forgot to mention there might be a little bit of a financial incentive to uh, go over to checking out that backbone series. Why? Because if you're telling a story of wildland fire and going above and beyond in your line of work, like I just said, well, there's an opportunity for you to win a thousand dollar mystery ranch backbone series scholarship. So go over there once again, www.mysteryranch.com. Check out the backbone series. The Anchor Point Podcast is also going to be brought to you by our premier coffee sponsor, and that is going to be none other than Hotshot Brewery. It's kick-ass coffee for a kick-ass cause, and a portion of the proceeds will always go back to the Wildland Firefighter Foundation. So if you want to get to, uh, getting after it with some kick-ass coffee for a kick-ass cause and maybe rock a holiday themed and holiday wildland firefighter themed. Yeah. Let's just go with that. Uh, t-shirts or some apparel. Well, that was your opportunity. They got some pretty, uh, funny, ugly Christmas tees and ugly Christmas sweaters over there. And, uh, if you want your opportunity to rock one of those, uh, maybe make a slightly inappropriate humor, uh, around the dinner table during your Christmas with your family. Well, yeah. Go over to www.hotshotbrewing.com and check it out. And while you're at it, you can get all the tools of the trade to get your morning started off right. You can get kick-ass coffee. You can get your Wildland Firefighter-themed apparel. And while you're over there, you can also uh, get some swag, some merch from uh, yours truly over here at the Anchor Point Podcast. So go over to www.hotshotbrewing.com and check it out. The Anchor Point Podcast would like to give a quick little shout out to our buddy Booze over at The Ass Movement. It's a funny name, but it's serious about stewardship. It's actually pretty cool. And if you don't know what that acronym stands for, well, it stands for the Anti-Surface Shitting Movement. Why is this important to me? Well, it's, it's a personal one. There's nothing more that I hate than going over to my favorite chucker hunting place or my favorite deer hunting place or my favorite fishing hole. And then, you know, walking up inevitably and stumbling across a human turd gift wrapped in a pile of toilet paper. That shit is disgusting and it needs to stop. Lucky for you, you can head over to www.thefirewild.com and check out the ass movement and get all of your poo bearing propaganda needs. Hell, even if uh, you have a problem pooper on your crew or in your family or your friends, you can even give them a little convenient turd trial to remind them to bury their turds. It's a serious problem. Needs to stop, folks. But you can do your part. So once again, go over to www.thefirewild.com and check out the ass movement where you can get 10% off your entire purchase by entering the code anchorpointass10 at checkout. So once again, www.thefirewild.com firewild.com. Check out the ass movement. And last but not least, the Anchor Point Podcast is going to be brought to you by the Smoky Generation, also known as the American Wildfire Experience, which, uh, yeah, that that name is kind of, uh, I guess, uh, misinforming. Yeah, because it's not just a uh, uh, it's not relegated to North America anymore. This is like a global experience and it's freaking badass. Basically what it is, is a digital archive, a digital uh, storytelling platform, if you will, about wildland fire. It's the story of wildland fire across the world dating all the way back to the 1940s. It's freaking epic. It's an epic 
project and Bethany has a kick-ass organization over there. Uh, it's awesome. So if you want to go over to, uh, check it out and take a trip down memory lane, get some, uh, stories from your peers in the field, go over to www.wildfireexperience.org and check it out because it's epic. And furthermore, if you happen to be one of these folks that is telling the story of wildland fire, whether you're a blogger, a writer, a photographer, anybody who's telling the story of wildland fire, well, you have an opportunity to tell your story in a more financially convenient fashion. So Bethany over there and the Smoky Generation and uh, AKA the American Wildfire Experience, well, they're doing uh, $500 grants for you folks in the field that are telling the story of wildland fire. But you have to uh, play to you have to play this game to win, so to speak. So can't uh, win one of these grants unless you're telling your story and you don't apply. I mean, you need to apply for this whole thing, right? So once again, if you guys want to check it out, if you guys and girls out there want to check it out, go over to www.wildfireexperience.com and check it out. and opinions of this podcast do not reflect the views and opinions of the United States government, the Department of the Interior, the Department of Defense, the Department of Agriculture, the United States Forest Service, the Bureau of Land Management, National Park Service, the Bureau of Indian Affairs, or any private, municipal, county, or state firefighting organization, any law enforcement agency, any medical provider, or any contractor employed by any federal agency. What's going on, ladies and gentlemen? Welcome back. So I hope everybody had a great Thanksgiving and I uh, hope that everybody's going to be enjoying the upcoming holidays. Looks like uh, the Santa Ana season has kind of been a bust. So maybe you guys uh, and girls out there, maybe uh, you'll get some well-deserved time off for the holidays, hopefully. Uh, infrastructure bill passed. Uh, we're working on Tim's Act, so that's pretty awesome. And uh, yeah, hopefully all these things will come together. So uh, before we get rolling into the episode, I just want to make a huge shout out to uh, Grassroots Wildland Firefighters. That organization is making some waves on Capitol Hill, and it's freaking awesome. So if you guys uh, want to go find out more about how to support the cause, well, I just shared a little video uh, during Thanksgiving about how you can do that, the easiest way to get involved and help out. So go over to www.grassrootswildlandfirefighters.com or www.grassrootswildlandfirefighters.com grwff.com and check it out with that being said today on the show uh we're gonna get into it and this is gonna be like fair warning here trigger warning hardcore here this is a heavy episode uh we're gonna talk to a australian firefighter who is involved in a burnover uh down in australia and uh yeah it is a pretty heavy episode we're gonna cover the incident we're gonna cop uh, cover the uh the lead up to this incident and we're going to talk about the effects that it had on her mental health. She is a badass woman in fire. And uh, yeah, she's got a hell of a story to tell. So with that being said, uh, I hope everybody intru- I hope everybody enjoys the show. And, and I want everybody to kind of reflect on uh, our job, uh, the situations that we get into, either it being accidental or coincidental. I mean, it sucks. But yeah, the harsh realities of our jobs, that is very dangerous. And we're going to talk about the uh, mental health component involved with it. So I hope everybody enjoys and really reflects on this uh, episode. Um, there are some periods of long pauses and uh, yeah, I, I chose not to edit them out because that's how real it is. And these, these uh, she just needed to take a moment in these quiet parts of the episode to just recollect herself. So um, yeah, if you guys uh, and girls out there listening to the episode, if you listen to any of these, uh, lo- these periods of silence, well, she just, she just needs a moment. So bear with us and uh, understand how hard it is and how difficult it is to tell her, uh, her story, her truth. But with that being said, I'd like to introduce my very good friend from all the way from Australia, Miss Emily Parnaby. Welcome to the Anchor Point. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another episode of the Anchor Point Podcast. Today on the show, I've got my very good friend all the way from Australia, Miss Emily Parnaby. What's going on? <laughs> Not much. Yeah. Not much. Just coming down here, Reno. Happy to be on the show. Yeah. 
Got a bit of a story to tell. And so I hear. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but before we get into that part, tell us about yourself. Um, I've moved over to California, I think about nearly four months ago now. I worked as a wildland firefighter in Australia for nine seasons. And uh, <laughs> everybody hates talking about themselves. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I get it. Yeah. <laughs> Just do the best you can. You're good. <laughs> so you're wildland firefighter for nine years. Yeah. Yeah. I've been working uh, for nine years, wildland firefighter, and had a few things happen over the last few seasons that uh, sort of... <sighs> I nearly ended up leaving fire completely mm -hmm. and decided that I cared too much about it um, to leave and do something else. So I moved over here and I'm currently studying a associate's degree in wildland fire behavior and trying to figure out how to get on a crew and get in the scene here. Gotcha. So I can hear like the, uh, the shaking and the tre trepidation in your voice. Like yeah. this is some pretty heavy shit. Like you wouldn't really go into the exact details of what happened to you while you were in Australia, but, uh, I'm pretty sure it's going to all come out yeah. on this episode. So I'm looking forward to a good one. Yeah. Getting some little insight as to the craziness that Australia wildland fire behavior can be. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I think my, my experience is quite a unique experience. It's not you know, run of the mill. So, you know, this is just, this is my story. There's nothing against either any of the agencies or, you know, anyone that works there, but, um, yeah, I've got some stuff to get off my chest and <laughs> nervous, but excited to do it. Yeah. Well, it's understandable. I mean, just speak your truth and, uh, yeah. Cheers. cheers. Let's make it a good one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And that is an old fashioned, ladies and gentlemen. And it is delicious. Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> so what got you into firefighting? Um, like how, how did you get your entry into it? Because like uh, everybody over here in the States, they don't know shit about wildland firefighting in Australia. Yeah. So I, I almost didn't get into fire at all. I'd um, been previously working in shearing sheds as a rouseabout and sheep shearer. And I was at or well, a few months before applying, I was um, engaged to a bloke that was also a shearer and we split up um, and I started looking for some other work because I didn't want to keep working on the same crew as him. And one of my friends suggested that I join the fire crew for the summer and see how things went. So I went down to the local um, depot and spoke to them and they said applications closed that night. Oh, shit. So <laughs> TikTok. Yeah. <laughs> Went home, quickly filled in my application, um, ended up getting on and working. I was working in a very, very small depot. There was only, I think, four of us on the crew. And I spent my first three seasons um, working there. It was like desert country, very... It was like a very cowboy kind of district, very old school. Sounds a lot like Eastern Nevada. <laughs> Um, yeah, and my first season got completely hooked. It was an absolute ripper of a season. We had uh, massive local campaign fires and it was just me and, um, another guy in his first year, pretty much rolling around together in our vehicle for the entirety of it, which is not something that it normally happens, but they. It's two rookies running a, running a truck. Yeah. Oh, wow. That's, that's kind of scary. Yeah. Looking back. Yeah. Like, terrible idea and our first shift um was like 26 hours and we got assigned um off -siding this it was basically just a local farmer whose his land was in potentially in the path of the fire and he came out with his tractor and he had a greater blade on the back and i jumped out to speak to him and sort of you know try and get a bit of a plan down and he swung open the cab and just like beer stench <laughs> it smells just, like a bar rag just hit me in the face <laughs> and he was like i have no idea what i'm doing I was like, obviously great neither do i let's let's go <laughs> so we spent half the night just following this guy around a burning lake bed trying to talk to him and now radios had either, either weren't working or he just wasn't listening to us <laughs> <laughs> selective hearing sounds like yeah yeah but uh yeah it was a lot of a lot of fun definitely um 
a little bit sketchy looking back, like having two complete rookies with a farmer, a drunk farmer, <laughs> <laughs> trying to contain this fire. But yeah, it was a lot of fun and definitely got me hooked. <laughs> so that's how you caught the fire bug, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> I guess. It's, it's pretty intense. Yeah. <laughs> but moving on though, I mean, you, you said you did nine years, right? And uh, yeah. is that at different depots as you call them? So stations? Yeah. Depot, um, depot, station. Yeah. <laughs> I'll translate the best I can. Thanks. Just- <laughs> I've, I've got like some terms that I know. So like the ones I know, I'll use the American version. But <laughs> um, yeah, so I did uh, my first two seasons at that one base. And then I sh- there was like a restructure happening in the um, organization. And they were sort of splitting fire staff from regular uh, like park maintenance staff mm-hmm. into sort of two completely separate teams, whereas previously it was all the one and um, us guys on the fire crew would go and help out with like facility maintenance and weed spraying and um, all the other like all the other yeah park maintenance stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so they they did this restructure, um, totally split things out. And my depot, um, we had the basically the ranger in charge got a higher position elsewhere. Mm-hmm. And the only other permanent there also ended up shifting into another position elsewhere. So for a little while, there was like me and one other guy there left. And I was getting calls from um, like the state center asking about all their assets. And I was like, okay, they're this is a little bit of they're going to shut this place down. <laughs> yeah. You don't have the leadership to uh, run it basically. Yeah. 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 Oh. Um, so I applied to a different depot in the same district and spent one season there and had a few issues with one of the permanent staff members being quite uh inappropriate so you're getting some uh harassment like yeah. sexual harassment yeah yeah um, that's an all too common thread with uh a lot of women out there in the fire it doesn't matter what country you're in yeah definitely yeah definitely and it's one of those hard things as well to put in any kind of complaint, like you don't want to, you don't want to be seen as, I don't know, like weak or not taking a joke or. Which is bullshit. Yeah. 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 And like, it, you know, anyone that's worked with me, I've grown up with boys. I know how, you know, I know how to roll with the boys. I'm all for a good laugh, but there's a certain point where it's like, no, yeah. no I'm uncomfortable. And this guy, um, we'd become quite good friends. And one night he'd been at the pub um bar <laughs> there's that translation <laughs> yeah <laughs> um and at i think it was like midnight or 1 a.m he started sending me pictures of my house that's fucking scary yeah yeah and he was like where are you i need to i need to talk to you i wasn't there thankfully yeah um that's but that dangerous was, yeah that was oh way shit too much. man <laughs> And yeah, he ended up, um, giving me like a real hard time at work and trying to get me fired and he wasn't getting what he wanted. So he decided to just go the extra mile and be a complete piece of shit. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Fuck that guy. Yeah. <laughs> He's since moved on, but Probably yeah, that was a good thing. Definitely a good thing. Um, but yeah, there was, I, you know, I found it difficult trying to sort of like raise that. And he was a very integral part of the team. He had all these qualifications that no one else had. And I was, you know, quite torn. He was also married actually. So I was like, mm. <sighs> like, mm. I don't know what to do here. Like, I don't want to upset. <laughs> <laughs> upset the balance the of balance. the force. Yeah. 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 Um, so I ended up leaving and for a little while there, I wasn't sure if I wanted to do fire or if I was, you know, going to go do something else. And I spent the winter sort of looking at other jobs and I just figured they were all rubbish. <laughs> <laughs> and I discovered um, another depot it was part of a different district. So I wouldn't have to deal with, you know, the bullshit, the bullshit. And I applied there, got on. Um, and that was where I spent the rest of my time in Australia. Um, and at first it, it seemed like a much more professional organized setup. Um, the first season there was pretty mundane. There wasn't too much going on. Um, 
we did have in the off season after my first season, one of the guys from the crew um, took his life, which was, oh. yeah, that, okay. that was pretty hard. Um, sorry. <laughs> it's okay. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> you took your time if you need to. It's all right. It's okay. <sighs> yeah, that was that was something that, you know, kind of shook the whole team. Like no one no one expected that at all. He was just like such I suppose as everyone always says, he was like such a happy, outgoing, fun person. Like you wouldn't have ever expected that um so it really really kind of shook the team and we had um had one of the captains leave that season as well and i ended up getting offered uh that position and i was working alongside um a bloke who he was how can i explain this he was so it was basically the big boss and then there was the soup and then the two captains so me and this other guy and he was the son of the big boss a little nepotism going on there yeah yeah <laughs> yeah which i didn't see at first i sort of hadn't really been around long enough we hadn't had fires um to really sort of see how how things worked and what he was capable of or not capable of but the longer i stayed at the depot and sort of watched him um, as a supposed leader, it became more and more apparent that he was not yeah. a leader, you know, just didn't have leadership qualities and also didn't seem to want to be there at all. Like almost as if he felt the pressure to stay in fire because that was what was expected of him. So he wasn't in it for the right reasons. No. Then he was, what do you, what do you call it? A dead ass? Yeah. Yes. A dead ass <laughs> at his job. Yeah. 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 Which means just like a piece of shit, I guess. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> trying to make sure that that lined up properly. In, <laughs> in, incompetent for his role. Gotcha. Yeah. So it's another hazardous situation that you're being put into, uh, potentially. I mean, if there was something that was well beyond his scope of dealing with or his knowledge base is, yeah. That's very hazardous. You've got nine years of experience at this point. Well, eight. Well, at, when I first started there, I only had three. Gotcha. And I think he was in his eighth. Yeah. He just wasn't picking it up after eight years. No. Gotcha. No. And I, th- I, I do think it was just like lack of interest, but then he just didn't want to, I don't know, tell his father that he, that wasn't what he wanted to do. <laughs> You know, I don't think that you should go into a very hazardous career if your no. heart's not in the right place. No, no. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. That seems like a recipe for getting injured or if not worse. Yeah. Or getting even worse than that, getting somebody else. Yeah. Hurt yeah. Or, or killed. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Jesus, and I think man. that's, I mean, nothing's happened really so far, but I think he's been very lucky with that and he's had other people cover his ass for him yeah like i've done on several (laughs) occasions like um a lot of just even just like prescribed burn um operations that we would do it was fairly common that i would be in charge of ignition and he would be in charge of patrol holding yeah yeah holding patrol yeah yeah um and 99 percent of the time there would be some major spot over that happened right next to his vehicle with him inside of it. What was he doing? Fucking around on his phone? Yeah. Oh. That yeah, was, literally. Literally. Literally okay. fucking around on that was his a good phone. Guess. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> and yeah, most times I discovered it before he did. And There's we like had to pull up the whole freaking show oh. for this guy that every single time, it was like multiple times a season. That he would just every single season. Jesus, man. And I don't know if no one else noticed because it was 
me discovering it most of the time. But it was like, there was times we got a brand new vehicle and the mirror melted on it because he was that, like, it was right there. And he was just sitting in it on his phone. No idea that there's flames in his passenger window, basically. How do you not notice the radiant heat off of that? I don't know. Like, how do you have such a egregious lack of situational awareness? I have no idea. It was amazing, really. <laughs> That's incredible. I, I yeah. have like a hard time wrapping my head around that. I've seen some dumb shit on fire lines before. Yeah, I bet. Yeah. To even neglect your own personal safety. That's like. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Jesus, man. <laughs> yeah. But do, it, do you mind if I ask you a personal question here? Uh, bringing you back to the uh, sexual harassment and stuff. Mm -hmm. I just want it. I don't. Unfortunately, I don't have a lot of women that come on the show. Um, it's, yeah. you know, I mean, it's kind of representative of actual demographics of fire, right? Mm. I've about the same. Well, I, I wish I had more women on the show, but it's they're few and far between. It's yeah. a very male dominated industry and I have a hard time finding those women in fire. So I want to ask you uh, a, a personal question regarding the sexual harassment thing. Like what prevented you from saying anything? Is it just like the fear of being the new person or what? Like how did how do how would you explain your your reasoning behind not saying anything and keeping quiet because i know that's very common across many women in fire yeah it's it's an interesting one i think it's it's just fear of having it turned against you yeah and people saying oh well you know you must have been behaving in a way to i don't know try and lure him in or you're being provocative or something it's like not at all who I am <laughs> being friendly like, and like giving people yeah. a rash of shit, you know, I mean, that's not flirting. No, there's an obvious no. distinction between like hitting on somebody and just being nice. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I feel like this probably is like a global thing to a degree, but oh, I feel yes, like definitely absolutely. in Australia, there's, there's a real thing of like, if a pretty girl is nice to you, a lot of people just think that, Oh, she must be hitting on me. No. And it's like, no, I'm just not being a dick. <laughs> I'm just talking to you as a human to another human. Yeah. Respectfully and nicely like this. <laughs> what about the fear of reprisal too? Because I know that's another commonality, uh, at least with a lot of women in fire that I've talked to via my Instagram, reaching out for help. Yeah. Um, a, a really common thing is they're really afraid to paint a target on their back. Like, yeah, is, that's... Yeah. Could you, I mean, could you get into that and like explain the details of why? I understand the fear and the reprisal thing like that, but if someone's fucking with you, man, I, I just, yeah. Yeah. It's really interesting. I think it's something that we are kind of taught as we're growing up to just not make a scene, not make a fuss, just kind of, you know, don't worry about it. That's, you know, he's just an idiot. Just don't worry about it. Move on. Don't rock the boat. Mm -hmm. And I, it's interesting. Now I'm thinking about it. I don't, I don't know what the actual fear is there. Like, I think it's just uncomfortable. It's definitely uncomfortable. I can imagine. Um, looked at and having, you know, everyone know that, oh, you're the person that's reported this guy that's, you know, quite high up in the organization. Yeah, it's, I don't know, it's an interesting one. Because there's not, I, th I think a lot of the problem is that there's not examples or not many good examples for us, particularly in fire where in that initial district I was working in, I think for the first season I was the only female in the district. So there's no females up in higher positions anywhere mm -hmm. that I could sort of look to or get any advice from. And because I think there's a big fear of just having it turned on you and swept under the rug and then everyone's just talking about you and you still have to work with this person. I can understand that becoming very hostile very quickly. Yeah. Because you did what's right, you know. I mean, that's a thing, but the yeah. ego part is going to play into that. Especially, I mean, I, I don't even know what would be worse. Like, the way I see it, I mean, I, I'm not a woman, obviously, so... 
I don't know what that, what goes through a woman's mind. And I have, I'm not even going to pretend to understand the, the disconnect there, you know, the, the reasoning behind these things, but I can understand. I've seen it before. I mean, women get fucked with a lot. Yeah. And it doesn't matter if you're in Australia, Canada, United States, it doesn't matter wherever there's a, a male dominated industry, pretty much even exclude excluding fire. Yeah. It's the same shit, man. Yeah. And it's all for like the same reasons that they don't say anything. It's all the same thing. The same reasons that you're saying as well. It seems like to be a common thread. And I, I don't know how to instill that courage into the women out there in the workforce. If someone's fucking with you, you're like, Hey, you know what? Tell that guy to go pound sand. Yeah. And if it's like, you know, if it's like something serious, like, like your, your instance, like fucking report that dude, get his ass fired. It's unacceptable. Yeah. You're a professional. And if that happened to me now, I totally would report it. It'd be completely different. But at the time I was like 22 years old. I think you've had a little bit of uh, play in that decision. Yeah. 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 I think so. And I, I was, um, I was quite a shy person when I was younger as well. It's something that fires definitely helped me develop, uh, my confidence and voice. Mm-hmm. Um, but back then I, you know, I, just didn't really, I didn't want to speak up about too many things. I didn't want to cause trouble or get in trouble. And so I just kind of kept as much as I could to myself and just got on with it Hmm. when I could. (laughs) But yeah, man, I I don't, I don't know what would be worse in that situation. Say you did go through with reporting him. He say he got either, there's like two options there, right? Either Mm -hmm. it's a reprimand or he gets fired, right? Or nothing. Or nothing. Or so nothing. three. Yeah. Which, which is, is the worst. Yeah. Which is the worst. And with other things he's done wrong in the past. He has a track record. Yeah. He has the track record. Not with women that I know of, but with other things. Yeah. Um, it was just nothing happened. Hmm. That's fucked up, man. Yeah. If he, especially if they have a track record of harassment. Yeah. Whether it be against women or whoever. I mean, they have a, if looks like a duck. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, fuck man. Got to do something about it. But that's another thing too, is like, it's what's worse. Like the reprimand and him holding that over your shoulders, like over your head for the rest of the time you're there, him getting fired and dealing with the backlash of the crew mm. or the ultimate worst where he's still in place. Nothing happens, but he knows that you said something. Yeah. Oh my God. I couldn't yeah. imagine the, the amount of anxiety that would cause someone. Yeah. Oh, it was incredible. I was basically not functioning very well for a while. Like I was having panic attacks. I wasn't eating. Like I was just going to work on autopilot every single day and just nervous of what's he going to do next? What's he going to say next? What am I going to do? How am I going to get out of this situation? Like I need the money, but I don't want to be here. I just felt like sick to my stomach every single day going to work. Yeah. I'm sorry. It is what it is. (laughs) I mean, if you had any words of advice, any sage words of advice for the women out there in the workforce now, like experiencing something similar, what would you say to them? Speak up, speak up. It's, it will be terrifying and it will be hard going through with it. Um, but it's better than just letting someone continue on because if, if if you leave and say nothing there's nothing stopping them from doing it to the next person that walks through yeah i can imagine that it's if it's a repeated issue that you're not going to be the only one you probably weren't the only one and you're not going to be the last one no yeah no jesus man yeah <laughs> well sorry to take that turn for a dark conversation but <laughs> no, i hope that right. inspires some people out there you know like speak up because a lot of the people that reach out to me in confidence, um, and ask for advice of what to do, uh, 99% of the time they never follow through with it. Yeah. Even though I'm like, Hey, this is what you do. This is how you file this paperwork and this is what you're going to expect. And I also give them a very, uh, real talk about the heads up or I give them a real heads up and a very real conversation about what to expect as far as reprisal, like Mm. coming down the line later as a result of doing this, but it takes a lot of courage to actually go through with it. Yeah. And I hope that people honestly do that more often. 
Yeah, me too. Yeah. Me too. Oof. <laughs> so anyway, let's just turn this back around 180 degrees. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> we're at the uh, inept dead ass uh, leader using that yeah. air quotes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Ain't yeah. a fucking leader. I can tell you that. No, he's definitely not. Kind of a dipshit with no regard for his own safety or his crew safety. Yep. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I was in my second year and I was the other captain and sort of just trying to fumble my way into, you know, learning leadership skills and trying to sort of change, um, a few little things around the depot and the culture. Cause it was previously a very, very much a boys club. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know that that had a female there ever prior to me, not on the crew. I'd. I can't think of one. No. Gotcha. So it was quite a new experience for them that there was definitely some like real boys club um, issues that were sort of there and it was very clicky and. Um, oh yeah. Yeah. They're always clicky. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah. So I, I, you know, sort of put a few little things in place to sort of try and bring up the culture over that year and learn some leadership skills. And it was all fairly mundane and, third year comes around and the old captain comes back on board and he previously had no issue with me when I was just a crew member. But now that he was back as, um, as a crew member and I was the captain, something, I don't know, for some reason didn't sit right with him. I don't know if he wanted his old spot back. It sounds like. I think so. Yeah. Um, and he, (laughs) over the course of that year, basically just, undermined undermined me constantly was constantly trying to make me look stupid and um saying like really really petty things even down to like I had this 10 liter water bottle that I used to carry with me and he made some comment about how like I don't know how shit it was (laughs) and it's like oh it's gonna melt on the back of the utes and it's like no no, it'll be but fine. It'll be fine. Yeah. It'll be fine. I've had the same like Nalgene it's, water bottles it's for like fine. fucking six Forever. years. Yeah. yeah. But he just used to say like dumb shit He's to the yeah. whole depot about my stuff and be all like, oh, I don't know who this is. Like, you know very well. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we'd go out doing like our project work or whatever it was um, day to day. And I'd like run through what the plan was and what everyone was going to be doing and every single turn there was, he had something to interject or was just constantly trying to like undermine me. And he was saying one lunch, um, actually I I wouldn't normally say this, but I think it is important to this story. He, he was an indigenous, um, person. Mm -hmm. So he had quite a connection to country. Um, and he said one lunch when we were all sitting down that women shouldn't work on land and women shouldn't work in fire. It's not our place. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. And I kind of just, you know, didn't worry about it, didn't say anything. I was it was very clear by this point that he was just trying to get under my skin. He was just saying it just to piss you off, get a yeah. rise rise out of you. Yeah. yeah. And I'd spoken to other people in the crew about like, you know, what was happening. And they were like, oh, you know, that's, that's just him. That's just, that's just what he's like. Don't worry just about him it. Being him. Like, cool. Well, <laughs> God, man. whatever. Um, what a dick. <laughs> God, yeah. God, man. Yeah. <laughs> um, and the next season rolls around. And first day that he was back on, we were in the vehicle together. We jumped in. We are just going down to um, like the district office to pick up new PPE and stuff. And he jumped in the driver's seat. I jumped in the passenger seat and the windows on our, uh, the side mirrors on our vehicles, you have to like manually adjust yourself. Mm -hmm. And so I asked him if the mirror was good for him and he didn't say anything at all. Like he'd just completely not acknowledge my existence. He decided that I no longer. You are no longer I, I, of value. Yeah. 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 Whole, whole day was silent. Actually, I completely forgot earlier. 
at the end of the last fire season when we were doing prescribed burns, it had gone to the point he'd stopped acknowledging my existence then as well and he'd tell people to tell me if I was like ignition crew leader he'd tell people to tell me things instead of just talking directly to me over the radio so what it was, the fuck is this like some sort of divorce parent situation like yeah it's so bizarre it's so weird so weird oh so weird it's like 12 year old girl bullshit right yeah. like <laughs> so it's getting in the way of operations at this point but yeah so the next season came around and first day he just didn't acknowledge my existence and i went to the soup and i was like dude like this is what's going on i cannot do another season like this like we need to sort something out here i've tried talking to him it's just nothing's happening huh. um, his ego was damaged because he was the little guy on the totem pole yeah i don't know yeah. probably i mean if he also this fucking experience and everything the right thing would have been to do uh, the right thing to do would have been to uh like take you under his wing and be like hey yeah. these are some things i learned you know yeah and no. he's, he was very, very good at that with the rookies. With dudes, like, probably. Eh, no, and anyone that was, anyone that he could teach something to. Yeah. He was very good at that. But I think at this point he was like, I can't, you know, I don't have much to offer. Emily. <laughs> so he didn't know what to do with that. And I had his old position and I think it just came out in. Just some sort of like, like catty fucking. Yeah. Oh my God. Man. Yeah. 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 To the point. Actually, here's another thing I've just remembered. To the point that he had spoken to the soup in the off season and said that he found it confusing with two captains, even though he was previously one of two. And so I had my position stripped the following season. So he got Which, you taken away of your Yeah. And then they only status. had uh the son as the captain. He was the only And he's a dead ass. Yeah. But I was still fully expected to do the duties of the captain. <laughs> the captain. What but I just I'm was sorry, not to have a, a title. Wrapping my fucking head around this. Yeah, because it's ridiculous. Oh my god. <laughs> it's ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> this so, is some next level dumb I, i'm it yeah. really is it really is and i'm probably going to be all over the place trying to explain this because it is just next level dumb and there's so many stupid little things along the way that just keep adding up into this borderline fucking catastrophe from my from my understanding yeah yeah, yeah the, it was. Well, that's the thing too so we have this theory called the swiss cheese model right yeah are you familiar yes okay yeah it's where you know you Swiss cheese, you know, slices has holes in it. Yeah. Now you can orient those, you know, parallel to each other. And pretty soon, eventually one of those holes is, which is going to represent like a blind spot. Yeah. You got a hazard on one side and it's going to go to, you know, some sort of catastrophic thing. It's like some sort of catastrophic failure or tragedy or whatever. Yeah. It sounds like the Swiss cheese model is like lining up oh, already. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And this is just general run of the mill every single day. Yeah. <laughs> for us jesus yeah um yeah so anyway i spoke to the soup and he was like okay um well we'll have to do something if he's you know if he's not speaking to you at all that's not going to work for work um i think it was the following day uh, i got to work and this guy pulled me aside and we went into the lunchroom, which we never actually had lunch in the lunchroom. It was like a meeting room. Went to have conversations, really. <laughs> <laughs> it's the principal's office. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we went in there um, and sort of spoke about things. And I was like, look, dude, I don't know what I've done. I, I don't know how I can fix anything with you. I don't need you to like me, but we need to be able to communicate to get along in this job. And we sort of spoke a little bit. And he was, he was happy to try and basically just said that he, he felt like I was stepping on other people's toes, AKA his, his, and I think the other captains or at this point, the only captains. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I acknowledge that and 
a couple of weeks later, we got sent away on the first task force of the season. This was the start of uh, what we call Black Summer. So this was our 2019, 2020 season. It was the one where the whole country was on fire. Yeah. Like everywhere you looked, there was fucking fire. Yeah. 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 Um, So yeah, we we got sent away together, which was quite a... (laughs) risky thing to do i think because they were aware in the district office that we had issues yeah um but i right from the get-go like set out like this is a week where i can form a relationship with this guy or it'll just be a total disaster (laughs) (laughs) or else it's just either or or. yeah (laughs) um and yeah over pretty much just the journey down to where we we're headed. It was complete opposite side of the state. It was like 12 hour drive or something. We got on really good terms and sort of sorted out everything. West rest of the week was, you know, fairly fine. It was kind of challenging. He's a challenging person, mm-hmm. but from that point on, we got along and he'd formed a respect for me that I never thought I'd even get from him, which was great. I'm making uh, headway. That's good. Yeah. 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 So I was feeling pretty happy with myself at this point. <laughs> like I'd done what I thought was the impossible with this guy. Um, and as the season went on and everyone just kept going on rotations through and through, he seemed to be, uh, I'd say struggling with fatigue and his mental health quite a lot. Is he, he had quite a hard upbringing and he'd had some um issues in in the past with i think like just depression and anxiety and he also had a a tendency to sort of overthink things to the point of sort of creating scenarios that weren't real in his mind and believing them Hmm. yeah um and he he was like Was he like undiagnosed schizophrenic bipolar or something or possibly. 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 I mean, yeah, I don't want to Who knows? Who knows? Who knows? But quite possibly. Um and yeah, as as the season went on and the rotations were getting um going and you were sort of just going back to back, he started having to pull out and I was filling his place. Um just putting quite a toll on me at this point. I was just getting more and more tired and all of the stuff that we saw throughout that fire season was like pretty difficult. Yeah. I mean, this is your backyard that's on fire. Yeah. Like the entire fucking continent is on fire. Yeah. And yeah, yeah, it's not a country. It's a country. Yeah. Don't get me wrong, but it's also a fucking continent. Yeah. Like when I remember was going there for my honeymoon, we were like, oh yeah. Okay. We're getting into like the Northern part of Australia and I'm like, fuck, we're almost there yet. No, motherfucker, you're not. I woke up seven hours later on the flight. And I swear <laughs> to God, I was like in the middle of the continent. I'm like, holy shit. I'm over Perth or not Perth. What was the, the, the city in the center? Basically, Ellis Springs. Ellis Springs. Yeah. yeah. I'm like, yeah. Jesus Christ. We got another five hours to go to Melbourne. Yeah. Like, well, it's it's God. almost as big as the US. Yeah, it's it's pretty big. It's it's huge. Yeah, it's huge. I think people wildly underestimate the size of Australia though. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But absolutely. Regardless, whole fucking country's <laughs> on fire. Yeah. Yeah. So every everyone's, you know, just at their absolute limits. Um and he he was really showing it and he ended up going on um a task force with uh one of the female rookies from our crew and this was sort of at the point where he was starting to get like probably not okay to be on fires and there was one night where they were in a paddock field paddock (laughs) oh you call it paddock no it's the field yeah i'm just remembering that from when i was down there (laughs) yeah um and there was it was like completely you know eaten out been grazed fully there was nothing really that could catch on there was embers sort of coming down and he was very he was quite manic about the whole situation and a lot of the other crews were just kind of like s- slowly meandering along just yeah you're in a relatively safe space yeah it was fine yeah like nothing's gonna take and tear off um but in his mind it was 
completely different story and he was tearing around this um, paddock at 100 mile an hour and ended up hitting a wombat hole nearly rolled the vehicle it like got airborne and uh this girl that he was with uh came out of her seat basically landed on the center console did something to her shoulder like ended up being quite injured because he was just off on one at this point and then he ended up telling her off because she got injured yeah because that's the right thing to do (laughs) yeah yeah jesus man yeah um and there was <laughs> these are things start getting quite interesting with cover ups and stuff. Um, that was reported. Nothing ever happened with it. Nothing ever happened with him. Mm-hmm. So he'd injured his own crewmate and was just that was fine. Um <laughs> somehow. <laughs> hmm. Yeah. <laughs> um Sorry. It's all right. Take your time. Thanks. (laughs) No worries. Yeah, so the fire sort of started winding down and we got returned to our home districts pretty much on a permanent basis, start preparing uh, for the prescribed burn program. And Sorry. <laughs> Take your time. It's okay. So we're out one day, um, just doing prep on this burn unit. And after lunch, this guy was walking around under the canopy with no hard hat. And it's like our big role. You always have to have your hard hat on no matter what works you're doing, you have to have your hard hat on. And one of the other guys on the crew mentioned it to him. He was like, Hey, you should probably put your hard hat on. And he just got completely shut down. He was like, who do you think you are? That's so disrespectful. You can't speak to me like that. And just this, yeah, tirade of like (laughs) abuse at this guy. And he just ended up walking away. Um, went back to the depot that night and he told the supervisor what happened and then supervisor went and spoke to this guy about it. And the following morning, I wasn't actually there that day. I went up to my old district to interview for a suit position up there. Um, and I dropped back in that afternoon and half of the crew was missing And everyone was miserable. I was like, what the hell has happened? I leave for an hour. What the fuck is going on? It's like, I haven't been here for one day and shit has gone down. Mm. And I find out um, that that morning, um, the guy that was kind of getting a little bit unhinged um, approached the one that spoke to him about the hard hat and just started going off at him and soup came in to see sort of what was going on. And, uh, yeah, this guy turned around and said that everyone, everyone bitches behind each other's backs on their crew and just started going off and trying to say that we had like all of these issues that just weren't, weren't issues at all. And they ended up calling basically like a round table meeting 
where theoretically everyone was supposed to just sort of, you know, put their problems out. Yeah, hash it out. Yeah. Yeah. But what ended up happening um, was basically no one really had anything to say because no one had any problems with anyone else except for this guy. And he just spent the whole time just abusing everyone. <laughs> just got on a soapbox and decided yeah. to just verbally abuse yeah. everybody. Yeah. And I don't know why that didn't get stopped by anyone. Like, I don't know why a, the soup didn't control that situation more or secondarily to that. The captain didn't say anything it's from everything that I'd been told about what was said there. There's no way that I would let that just, just go, just go. Yeah. Just go. Like you don't, you just don't attack the people on your own crew like that. Like as a leader, you're there to, you know, protect and look after your crew. And if there's issues in there, you're like, yeah, you squash that shit. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You work it out, but it was all just like free reign. And a lot of people ended up uh, coming away, like really, really upset. There was a lot of like very, very harsh personal attacks that happened in there. And uh, one of them was towards, a young girl that was on the crew and she for the day had been allocated in the vehicle with this guy. No one bothered to change that. So they just got sent out for the day and she was like crying in the vehicle with this guy that had just been abusing her. I wouldn't want to be in a vehicle with that person after they rolled almost no. rolled a truck. Sorry. Yeah, no. Yeah. No, not at all. So there's a fear element in that. Absolutely. And then there's also like and a harassment thing. Yeah. Element with that as, as well. Yeah. Yeah. Ooh. Yeah. Not good. <laughs> and a couple of days later, the soup ended up, um, he ended up in hospital with a perforated bowel. I don't know if it was from the stress of, I guess what he'd done. <laughs> in a way, but he, he was off for the rest of the season. Um, and his boss and the captain went on holidays for like a week or two weeks. So I was stuck there alone with this crew that was about to implode, trying to keep the peace with everyone. Oh, and there was like three people that were like, started having like suicidal thoughts there was <sighs> this guy was getting like more and more unhinged as well and it was like a really really difficult thing for me trying to protect all my guys when I could see that you know he, he was just blatantly attacking them he was sounds like the guy needs help yeah definitely yeah. Definitely. But in that state, you know, you can't tell someone. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I was kind of just stuck there with no power and people screaming at me on all sides that I needed to do something and he had to go and I had to just try and manage everyone's emotions and all the tensions and keeping them from resigning or doing something that just wouldn't help the situation at all. And also trying to keep him on the good side whilst he's, you know, questioning me, why am I only being put with these people? What's going on? What are they doing? And it was something that for me, Particularly at, at this point, I had this, you know, application and I was waiting to hear back from the interview for the suit position up north. Mm -hmm. So that was another factor in there. People were like quite, they were like, oh, why should we speak to you when you're just going to fuck off? Yeah. I was like, well. They're kind of pissed if, that you were trying to better yourself. Well, they're pissed yeah. that you're potentially leaving is what it is. Yeah. It's just a misplaced yeah. anger at that point. Yeah. Yeah. And I said to them at the end of the day, like if if you guys need me here, I'm not going to take that position. 
Like if I'm more use here to you now, I'm going to do that. Like I'll sacrifice that yeah. job. But there was still that like anger. <laughs> and that really started affecting me quite a lot of having just like all this pressure on my shoulders, trying to manage this incredibly volatile situation um, with no help from anyone anywhere really and it's like no idea you. yeah 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 and i just had to balance it until <laughs> the soup and the captain go fuck off and go on holiday or whatever yeah yeah so we're on a tropical island <laughs> jesus yeah so i think it was about two two weeks that i just had to juggle that for and then the big boss came back and uh, the captain came back and for some reason he was just in a mood and made the whole thing freaking worse. Oh, fuck. <laughs> and the soup's still in hospital away. We've got the big boss who is a very hands-off person in general. He only sort of popped in every now and again because he had to, because no one else was there. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm still they're managing everything managing the actual captain's bullshit and all of the stuff that he's sort of like kicking up as well we're in the middle of planned burn season prescribed burn season so we've got all that extra pressure on us uh from that and trying to pick up the slack from everything that he's not doing and the big boss ended up um, just trying to avoid any kind of situation with HR and quieten the whole thing down. We'd sort of put in a bit of a complaint um, that was gaining a bit of traction and he didn't like that at all. So there was a day that there was meant to be counsellors and the EPA come to, sorry, the EPA. No, Environmental EPA. Protection Agency. No, not that. <laughs> um, was it the Employee... A- employee Assistance Pro- Program? EAP. EAP. See, I had the letters right. <laughs> just, just, just a bit dyslexic. Just <laughs> it's all good. <laughs> um, yeah. So there was a day that they were due to come and there was four of us that really had quite a lot to say on that day and we'd been planned to go on a task force out of district on that day, mm-hmm. which I think was a strategic move to get us out of the way so that we wouldn't say what was actually going on. And it ended up being cut down to only two of us, but it was again, the two of us that were most vocal. It was me and um, one of the other girls and we got sent away for a week, came back and this guy was just gone. Gone. Just gone. Problem solved. Not really. Uh, not really. Yeah. Not really. He was he was told to kind of move along. He wasn't fired. There was no repercussions. He was just basically told it's best for you if you leave now. You can't win this. Um there he was offered to resign. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. And a lot of the guys were quite unhappy with that which, I mean, is understandable. Some of them have been injured by this guy and there's just absolutely no repercussions. There's no guarantee that he can't just come back the next season. There's there's nothing. Um, but we all kind of moved on with it and COVID had hit by this point, so we had a lot of other things to sort of worry about. The season ended and... Sorry. You're okay.
It's really interesting. I feel like my mind's like trying to squash a lot of. <laughs> Seems like you're holding a lot back. Yeah. You you don't. It's have like, to. no, I know I don't have to. I feel yeah. like I feel like my brain's just like, because I have spent so long over the last few years just kind of pushing everything into like this abyss in my mind where I don't have to think about it and I can't find it and I feel like it's almost like my mind's just autopiloting doing that human nature tends to uh repress a lot of things that are very negative in their lives so i want to applaud you for being vulnerable and courageous enough to come on the show thank you and actually say something (laughs) thank you yeah takes a lot yeah takes a lot of courage yeah (laughs) and i'm sure i'll look back at this and be like damn i wish i'd said that or (laughs) (laughs) You say whatever you need to. But yeah. Yeah, so at the end of that season, I was pretty (laughs) exhausted, just completely exhausted and quite broken down from just the complete lack of ramifications for bad behavior, injuring people, bullying people. It had become like very apparent to me that although there's supposed to be all these procedures in place um, and these policies that need to be followed, like not making people want to kill themselves, (laughs) none of that mattered. And, you know, if if you (sighs) tried to follow the proper procedure, for these sorts of incidences, it would just be completely stopped, buried under the rug, and you'd never hear about it again. And we had it was after after I finished the season, an external mediator came into the depot, and we all had uh, appointment times to meet with her and talk about everything that was sort of going on and all of. Uh, the issues that we had, how we thought things could be improved. And there was supposed to be all this sort of data and a a plan Mm -hmm. come out after this. Um, And after the meeting, there was no word ever again. Just buried in the Just completely buried. Wow. Yeah. So it was pretty much as soon as all of us crew members were off for the season, there was just the big boss. There's no one else. It's like everybody forgot about just it. Just made it disappear somehow. And this is the second of the depots that he is in charge of that has had this procedure happen. And both times they've just been swept under the rug. Swept under the rug. Jesus, man. Yeah. I I cannot imagine what that's like to face that, you know, for an entire season for a couple seasons the humiliation that comes along with that, not only for just yourself, but the rest of your crew members who have experienced this harassment to have that swept under the rug. Yeah. That's going to be wildly impactful to your mental health. Oh yeah. Completely devalidating. (laughs) It is just literally being told to shut up. No one wants to hear it. We don't care. You don't matter. Mm. And it's like, I think I found it so difficult because we were, we had such a good crew and I'd been working so hard to sort of like keep improving things and keep changing things for the better and just watching it get 
intentionally destroyed and then have the big boss be okay with that and further that is just, it was crushing. It was crushing. I'm sorry. Thanks. <sighs> so the next season rolls around and the old soup had gone, I'd normally say on secondment, um, but it was a different organization. They technically classified it as secondment. Um, so he, he was working for the um, indigenous group in the area and they were looking at trying to get uh, an indigenous burn plan in the district, which would have been super cool. It was something he was very passionate about and had started, um, you know, with my organization. So we hit the ground running with no soup and <laughs> it was initially said that it was going to basically be me and the other captain running the show, which in all reality meant it was going to be me running the show, but I wasn't going to get. So this is you and dead ass. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, it was, it was basically like his father didn't want to give me the recognition of the actual job title or pay with that. And he was just going to say, it's a shared responsibility. Well done, the both of you. Even though. <laughs> you know, that, that mentality happens or that, that very situation happens all too often. I mean, during a busy fire season, like if you take uh, you know, this fire season here yeah. in the United States, I mean, it's not uncommon for like a GS five or a GS six to be running a division. Yeah. It's you're constantly being asked to do more with less and sometimes not even have the calls to do so. You just have to struggle and do you're like expected to do these things. Yeah. Yeah. It's exactly the same back home. I I think it was in my <sighs> Must have been my sixth season. Um, not sure. It was the one before Black Summer anyway. We had quite a bad season in our state as well. And um, I ended up uh, like co-leading a task force with someone and I had no experience whatsoever in that. I was like super excited to do it. Yeah. Of course you want to do it. But yeah, I really wanted to do it. You also have to have a trainer with you along for the ride. You know, you yeah. can't just be thrown into the hot seat. Yeah. It gets really complex. It does. It does. And the person I had with me has been someone that's opened a lot of doors for me pretty much since I was in that district. He was the first person to let me lead ignition on a prescribed burn and he saw something in me and was like, right, we need yeah. to do something with you. Yeah. <laughs> um, so it was good to have him along with me, but I think if either of us were left without the other, the whole thing would have just completely fallen apart. Like we were just so integral to each other's working of that division. It was, it was super, super difficult. There was not a second that we had like, time to even breathe. I think there was one, one day where I didn't get to go to the bathroom for like 10 hours or oh, something. Jesus. It was, yeah, <laughs> just super full on. And we were getting thrown from one fire to another on complete opposite side of, uh, the state. And we were just like, here, here's a, here's a division for you guys. And we we're like, Oh, thanks. What are we doing? <laughs> no idea what we're doing. And that's just due to lack of resources. Like they're throwing where everybody, yeah. everybody, wherever they can get them. Wherever they could. Whatever yeah. they can handle. Yeah. On one of the opposite divisions that we had, there was a kid, I think he'd only done a couple of seasons and he was just, here you go. Do that's what you terrifying. can. Yeah. Yeah. Jesus, man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but we got through and, you know, for the both of us, it was... For me, I, definitely for me, it was the highlight of my career. Like I 
I've never been so exhausted, but I've never been more proud of what we achieved with what we were handed and the resources that we had. You get to push your boundaries. You yeah. Know? Yeah. Oh, really, really, really pushed it. <laughs> <laughs> that shit's exciting. It is. Yeah. Fun. Yeah, it was. Seeing what your limits are and yeah. seeing how far beyond, beyond your uh, limits you can go. Yeah. It's this was like tenfold beyond what I'd ever done. <laughs> But that was, yeah, that was great. Um, I have no idea what I was talking about before this. Uh, the season after Black Summer with that ass and you. Yes, that's right. Um, <laughs> like the nickname? I do. I do. <laughs> I was wondering if I was going to have to like make up another name for him. I got you. <laughs> but dead ass works. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, so we kind of hit the ground running with just us two and, uh, his father obviously thought better and thought we should advertise the suit position. So, uh, I think maybe three weeks into the season and this, um, gets advertised and I of course supply, um, and I, I knew that I'd be up against it with him being the hiring manager and not wanting to hire internal. Hire, well, not wanting, no, I think it was just me not wanting to hire me. Gotcha. Because if he hired me, it would then highlight that his son's <laughs> not capable, not capable, not yeah. capable. His son who'd been around for at this point, like 13 years was not capable and there's me there going above and beyond. And I think he just at all costs wanted to stop that. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. That sounds like nepotism with extra steps now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, oh man, I'm just, I keep remembering so many things from like previous, previous seasons, seasons that I've just completely forgotten about. <laughs> That's all good. <laughs> oh man. Um, I've completely lost my train of thought now. So dead ass and uh, you, and he doesn't want to admit that his son's a fuck up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so they, yeah, they advertised it externally, and he ended up giving it to. I will. I will. I must admit, I didn't do my best interview ever. <laughs> but um they can't win them all i yeah. bombed from some fucking interviews before man I, I, yeah yeah but i you know i felt like i'd sort of proven over the previous eight months and we'd not have a soup that i was capable mm -hmm. more than capable um but yeah anyway he ended up hiring uh a fella that I think he'd been around for the same time as me. He was from uh, another depot that he managed in a different district. And <laughs> go figure, right? Yeah. So many news. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and there were also basically more official versions of the captain position that got advertised at the same time. And me and dead ass. <laughs> um put in for those and two of the other guys from the crew also put in as well so everyone was pretty fed up with how things were going and everything was just constantly just falling apart yeah totally yeah. falling apart it was all falling on my shoulders and i can only carry so much yeah <laughs> and it was yeah just all falling apart um so they put in as well and we were all kind of we were really hoping that no matter which combination of people got got the positions, as long as Deadass didn't get one, everything was going to end up getting better and we could actually make something really, really cool yeah, you could turn out of this crew. We could totally, yeah. Turn it around, yeah. Totally turn it around. Um, and so the applicant, uh, the position... So what am I saying? 
the successful applicants for all of those positions um, ended up getting announced on the same day by the big boss. Um, although he was meant to be completely separate from the captain positions because his son was applying. So for yeah. conflict of interest, he, he, he wasn't on the panel. Um, but I, I noticed when I was doing the interview, it was being recorded and we weren't told it was recorded. And I hadn't thought about it. I didn't think about it at the time. It was only when I was speaking to one of the other applicants afterwards that I remembered that it was being recorded, presumably for him to review. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, he, he announced all three positions at the same time. And instead of getting, like we normally get a phone call, you've been recommended for this position. Would you like to take it? And you can say yes or no. He just came up to me in the yard and said, you've got this position. Deadass has got this other position and this bloke's going to be so. I was like. Okay. Radio. <laughs> Yay. Cool. Big smiles, everyone. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I never heard from the people that actually conducted the interview mm-hmm. ever again, which is. Kind of unheard of. Yeah. 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 And I'd said to them during my interview. Um, it was also another not good interview. I was like at my <laughs> wits end at this point after the previous season and everything sort of how it was looking. And I just said straight to them, I don't care who gets these positions as long as I'm not working with the same person I've been working with for the last few years, I cannot do that again. And if he's a successful applicant, I'm not going to. I I won't take this position. I don't want this position. Yeah. So, yeah, it was quite interesting just being told this is what you're doing. This is how it's going to be. This is the new soup. And he's not going to turn up for two months. <laughs> he's going to come in halfway through the season. Yep. Yep. How were you supposed to do the whole, like, forming storming norming and performing phase if you have a leadership figure coming in halfway through a season that's got to be difficult for yeah not only him but also for you guys yeah absolutely it was very difficult yeah and in that two months guess who everything landed on again yep (laughs) jesus yep and i was like more than willing I I said the whole way through to everyone, like, I don't care who gets this position, but they need to be able to put their foot down, see what's actually going on and have good leadership skills to sort this out. Yeah. Because I'm definitely not the most qualified person for the uh, position, but I know, I know my crew. I know our problems. I know what needs to be fixed and I've got a plan. Yeah, you know the politics of the situation yeah. too. Yeah. Which is, you know, half the battle. I mean, putting fire out is pretty easy. Yeah. But I mean, you, yeah, you put the cold stuff on the hot stuff. Cool. Yeah. End of the day. <laughs> um, the managing people is always going to be the hardest part. Yeah. Any fire fire position. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So he came in halfway through the season with not even a heads up on what was going on, which I didn't realize at the time. Oh. Yeah. So no one knew that he didn't know what had been going on and he didn't know, of course, what had been going on. So he just got landed in to this completely dysfunctional crew with me at this point, who was just on the edge of a nervous breakdown, like in a borderline toxic yeah, environment. Yeah. 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 Um, man, I, we got a really integral part of this. <laughs> Go with it. So way back at the start of the season, November, so that we had uh it was pretty much the only fires that we had for the season. We had two start one evening um in the desert and they just for us we didn't even have i think half of the crew wasn't even on 
at this point. We were still getting people sort of coming into their contracts. Yeah, and February is like the start of fire season, right? For you guys. No, no, no it'd be the end. Yeah. yeah. So like October, November is the start and like April is the end. Okay. Um, yeah. So these fires started and the first attack was, there was not many people on it because we were so understaffed. It was on a weekend. So we have this standby roster and you're either rostered on or off. It's just alternating weekends. It was my off weekend and I was sitting on our little like internal um, like intraweb with all our fire mapping stuff and looking at all the photos and checking things out. Oh, I used to do that shit all the time. Yeah. <laughs> you know, oh, let's check out the lightning map. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, and yeah, it w was just going off its head and I was scheduled on for the next morning. We're rolling out there at uh, 6am and we had like no maps, no idea about where anything actually was. We just kind of had to like kind of figure it out, fi figure it out. Yeah. yeah. So that was, that was my sort of first job for the day was, uh, just figure out where the perimeter of one of these fires was, what line had been put in the night before. Um, and it was on the, I guess the the lesser priority fires. So there was there was two in the same sort of block of the forest, and one of them was pretty close to a township. That one had completely gone off the night before, and the one I was working on was further west of that. So, sort of like worst case scenario, that was just going to run into the other one. Yeah. Um. So I was yeah, just sort of spinning around, finding where the perimeter was, looking at um what line had been put in and it was pretty much finished that work. And I heard some of the guys, um, in on one of the dozer lines following the dozer saying that they needed extra help. There was like, you know, spotting was starting to pick up a lot and they were waiting for another crew to come in, but they weren't there yet. So I thought I'd poke down that line and give them a hand for a little bit. And I got in there and there was almost exclusively people in their first and second year of fire on that line. So there was no real experience. There was the only experienced people were either operating a dozer who can't see jack shit um, or operating what we call a tanker, which is probably like a type two engine. Type two or type three. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I rolled in there and immediately noticed this massive plume going up that looked to be further east from our doze line. We were sort of tracking um, southwest, mm -hmm. further east from that. And the radio was completely clogged up with traffic from the other fire because for some reason they were running on the same frequency, on the same frequency, but it wasn't really, it was neither close enough or far enough to work properly. So there was just a lot of traffic coming through that was super broken up, couldn't really get on. So I decided to just drive up and get out and speak to each person and said, Hey, have you seen that? Like get ready to bug out. This isn't, this isn't good. Yeah. So um, things are lining up for yeah something bad happening. Yeah. 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 Um, and just as I was getting up to, uh, the people that were off the dozer, we had the air ops come over and inform us that this thing was well outside our line, which I thought it was, and that we weren't going to be able to get out. Was it uh, pushing towards you? Yeah. 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 Ruh row. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so we ended up sort of parking ourselves up as best we could in, I don't want to call it the black cause it was not black. There was like some underburn from the night before. 
It's like spotty burn. Yeah. 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 Like very much could go again. And we parked ourselves up in that and the dozer was um, trying to push in a bit of a pad for us. A little safety zone. Yeah. Yeah. Um, And this thing just like completely picked up and took off and went around us, which was lucky, f- lucky, very lucky. And then the Aerobs informed me that there were three fingers running through the black hard towards us. And <laughs> oh shit. Yeah. Yeah. And we were just basically sitting there waiting for aircraft and we got. They came over pretty much just in the nick of time. Like they dumped a load on enough to sort of like settle it down. But there was still, there was no way for us to get out. Yeah. You guys are completely surrounded. Yeah. This shit's still running at us. There's a 45 minute turnaround to get to reload. So I'm sitting there. And one of the old style vehicles, there was, I was the only old style vehicle there. Um, no burnover curtains, no deluge system, no nothing. And I remembered pulling out a woolen blanket that had probably been in the vehicle or had been passed from vehicle to vehicle for the last 40 years. Who knows? This was our burnover blanket. Oh, Jesus. Yeah. Well, you guys don't carry fire shelters. We don't have fire shelters yeah. at all. There's nothing. So I'm sitting there and I pulled out this burnover blanket and I just remember thinking like, like surely this isn't happening. Like surely I'm not sitting here right now with these kids about to like, I don't know, who knows? <sighs> it's all right. Take your time. You're okay. I remember sitting there and just thinking to myself, like, if I hadn't come in here, what would these guys be doing now? No one had, no one had noticed that. No one is even aware. No one had any idea at all. It's all right. Let it out. It's okay. It's <sighs> all 
in such a bizarre position to be in. To be in, suddenly in charge of all of these people's lives. When you yourself realistically have no idea what you're doing in that kind of situation. We don't practice. We don't do drills. We don't practice this situation. And it's, you're always told, which I, I think is wrong. You're told every initial training camp that, you know, the, this is a, a situation that is, it's possible but you'll always be pulled out beforehand. And that's something that they've always that's a said. That's fucking stuck. lie. Yeah. That was a fucking lie. Yeah. yeah. And I always thought that was so fucked for them to say that and put such emphasis on it. It's like, here's, here's a bad thing, but you'll never be put in that situation. You'll always be pulled out. Shit happens. Yeah. You're fighting one of the most powerful forces on the planet yeah. Earth. Yeah. With a fucking shovel. Yeah. It doesn't happen frequently, but it does have a very, yeah, it has a, a very good possibility of happening. Absolutely. And we'd yeah. had crews that had had close calls in the prior season. Um, one fire I was working on um, early in the, in the previous season, we, we were, we were just yeah, about ready to sort of uh, start hiking out with been cutting line and just weren't making the progress that we needed to make. Our line had been burnt over in a couple of spots. Um, and it was time to abandon the plane. Yeah. Yeah. We we're making our way out. Um, and our line had got burnt over up the top. Um, so we called in the bombers to sort of take care of that so we could get through and they started bombing below us and some of the guys were like getting really pissed off at this. And I realized like the fire had flanked us and it's underneath. Now below you. It was now below us and no one had any clue and they were getting pissed off at this aircraft yeah. for bombing that first. That's probably the higher priority. Absolutely. For yeah. Absolutely. Shit. Yeah. There's just all these little situations over the years that had been either just not recognized at all or ignored. And this was no different either. And we're, we will... We were lucky enough to get out with no injuries. But then it was just completely. It was like it never happened. You were burned over and there was no report. No. I mean, everybody survived. Yeah. But that shit would never fly. No. And it shouldn't. In other countries. No. No. And when you look at, like, we used to have monthly OHS meetings and you'd get all this data in from across the state and be like, oh, well, this week, three, or oh, this month, three, three people sprained their ankle and some idiot from the city office cut their finger on a knife unloading the dishwasher. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile. Yeah. An entire, uh, how many, how many people were there? Like six, seven, eight, ten? Probably ten, I think. Ten people narrowly escaped from a burnover situation alive. You guys had to sit there and write it out essentially. Yeah. And it was hours. Yeah. We were there for hours. So the wind, the wind uh, where we are does this, does this thing that's great when you're doing prescribed burns but not so great when you're sitting there just waiting to see if you're going to die or not, where it, it 
basically does a 180 on itself every so often. So you'll have your prevailing wind and then just randomly it'll completely turn on itself and it kind of just pushes back and everything gets quiet and then it'll change again. Huh. It's kind of like a phone, a phone wind effect. Yeah. Yeah. Or diurnal. Yeah. S- same shit basically. But yeah. So, so it's, y- we were in there for two hours. Just riding out the heat. Yeah. Daily systems on on the. Not in my vehicle. <laughs> well, not on your vehicle. <laughs> I'm just sitting there shitting myself. <laughs> and then the dozer trying to push out a safety zone. I mean, yep. you're not going to have enough time to push out a big enough safety zone. No. I mean, it's better than nothing, I suppose. Yeah. But but you guys we had- were so lucky with the timing of the aircraft. So, so lucky. Like from when the air ops first came over to that first drop to the second drop that we got that gave us a little window to sort of punch out. <laughs> Holy we were so, so lucky. And I think a lot of... <sighs> I think half of the problem with it not getting the attention that it should have, even though there were so many incident reports put in, was that a mayday was never made because the air ops was there immediately. Like, I'm not going to call a mayday asking for aerial assistance if I already have aerial assistance. Yeah. But still, you're... Yeah. Anyone listening would have known exactly what the hell was going on. Exactly. But you're in a hole too, so it's not like yeah. the neighboring fire can hear you because it's going to be broken no. and unreadable. Yeah. You could let alone barely even communicate with the people you're trying to reach in the first place. Yeah. Yeah. Aircraft, aircraft. And this whole time we're still getting cut over by the people on the other fire as well. <laughs> Sounds like there's a lot of opportunities to change. And I know there's a lot of different um, agencies in your neck of the woods. Yeah. And they don't play well with each other. No, not always. <laughs> not always. Well, I'm sorry. I'm talking about like standardization like with yeah. communications. Yeah. And just means of doing business of firefighting. That's what I mean by not playing well with each other. Yeah. Yeah. It's definitely getting better, but it's not where it should be. I hate saying this phrase, but it's, it's dark, but it's also true is that oftentimes the most important change doesn't come until a tragedy happens. Absolutely. I completely agree. And I don't see any changes happening until there are Lives lost, like another Black Sunday, or yeah, or is it Black Black, Black Sunday? Saturday? Black Saturday, so yeah, that was what um two thousands, right? Yeah, oh nine, oh nine. Is it oh nine? I think it was oh nine. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. So until we have another event like that, I don't think we're going to see any change, and until we lose people our own people from these issues that we already have, they're not going to get looked at because I think it's, it's too, I think it's too hard and people don't want to see these incredible failings and own up to them and make the changes needed because to this point in time, we haven't had any deaths from burnovers in a long time we rarely have deaths and so i feel like as long as that continues to be the case everyone can keep talking the talk and pretending that these things don't go on until they're forced to look at it really really forced to look at it there's that whole tragedy thing I mean, if you look at comparatively speaking, I mean, you know, we have a lot of uh, historical events, you know, we have South Canyon, we have Esperanza, we have Granite Mountain, we have all of these fires to predicate a safety protocol off of, right? And unfortunately, it's the same way with us. We've just experienced more of it. Mm. And we base all of our 10s and 18s. I mean, shit, even on the back of an IRPG, those things are there because someone died. Yeah. And And we've adopted most of those. Yeah. Changed them around a little bit because we couldn't possibly just 
leave a system that works the way it is. <laughs> yeah. But because we haven't had those tragedies, I don't think it hits home the same way. The status quo is, is dangerous. And I know that every agency out there, whether it's in your neck of the woods in any country, I mean, it's, we've got our issues. Yeah. But to have the courage to be proactive in identifying them and having some mitigation efforts before something happens. Yeah. Is the critical portion of that whole thing. Absolutely. I mean, fire seasons are only going to get, they're only trending one direction. It doesn't matter mm. where you are on the globe. It's only trending one direction. And that is more frequent, more intense, longer fire seasons. Yeah. Period. Yeah. Yeah. Change needs to happen. Absolutely. Absolutely. And um, yeah, so this was not even acknowledged, basically. Went home, went back out on the line the next day, and the day after, and the day after. No critical stress incident or critical incident stress debriefing or anything like that? No. Didn't no. even have a debriefing that night. That was... No AAR, not even like a nothing. talk it out between nothing. Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, it was basically just carry on with your season, like nothing happened, but this was playing on my mind quite a lot. And I had a lot of questions about. <sighs> I was mainly getting fixated on what would have happened if I hadn't gone in there. Not so much your own life, but no, yeah, no. Cause I years ago made peace with the idea that that was a possibility. Like I've chosen a career in fire. It's something that could happen and there's no point ignoring that. Like I need to be, if I'm not okay, with that being how I go, then why are you doing it in the first place? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. It uh, gets a little bit different though when you actually come face to face with your own mortality. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Shit gets real, real, real fast. It does. It does. And it was very, I remember being frustrated more than anything. Like I was like pissed. Yeah. I was pissed. Yeah. I was pissed. <laughs> And so detached at the same time, it was almost like, it almost felt like I was watching myself in that situation, but I was just so pissed about the whole thing. And that didn't go away afterwards. That sort of carried through the rest of the season. And I was talking to the big boss about it about a month later. And was trying to figure out sort of what what had happened and why I mean why the dozer was punching in line in that direction to begin with that to me rings alarm bells but because I'd been off on my own little <laughs> task earlier in the day I had no idea what anyone was really up to I was trying to put all the pieces together yeah, it's not like you have an in briefing or anything like that no yeah no um and he, he didn't really have too many answers for me, but I distinctly remember him saying when I was, you know, talking about, well, you know, doesn't it seem obvious that this would happen? He kind of just laughed and was like, yeah, I thought that might happen. And he was in charge in the incident control center. Like, why? Why would you take that risk? Why would you do that? Yeah. In the first place. Yeah. Not only jeopardizing your own life, but the lives of nine other people. Yeah. That don't know better. Yeah. That's a good lesson to be had with this story right here. If you're a rookie or a second year, or just someone who's young and fire. I mean, don't, don't blindly follow somebody. If something doesn't seem right or you're not comfortable, you need to speak up. 
Yeah. You need to ask questions of why we're doing this. And any good leader out there, they're going to answer your questions. They might answer, not answer it immediately. Cause I understand there's a point where you need to get shit done, but blind faith in your leadership, it's dangerous. Yeah. Especially when it's combined with naivety because you just don't know. Yeah. Absolutely. Aren't those cherries good? They are. <laughs> so good. <laughs> Jesus, man. Mm. I mean, there's a lot of lessons to be learned with this, this story. And, uh, yeah, these are things I definitely look out for. Yeah. And just a question for you. I mean, do, is, are other states, are they, they have the same kind of issues? I actually don't know. I don't know. We're all very, we're all very separate and we we're unlike over here where you have the same organizations across all of the States mm -hmm. and you all travel standardized. everywhere, yeah. standardized. It's not every single state has its own different organizations that do things differently. None of us communicate with each other. It's very rare for us to go help each other out. Like doing an assist, like say you have like yeah. a fire in New South Wales, like yeah, Queensland's not going to drive all the way across the country to generally not yeah. unless they're in dire need. Like at the start of Black Summer, I went on a task force to New South Wales, mm -hmm. which was horrifying. Honestly, <laughs> that, that I good, was huh? I was shocked at what I saw. I was shocked at what I saw. A cowboy, <sighs> as in like reckless. Very. Yeah. Very. And I came away from that task force feeling like they were almost burning their own stake to the ground at that point with the way that they were conducting backfiring operations. It was very apparent that they didn't have enough people with the skills and knowledge to be able to do that. And they just had anyone that could hold a drip torch burning. Pretty much aimlessly. Yeah. 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 I think that's a, uh, the standardization thing, you know, it's like, it's like when a hotshot crew comes in to burn a piece of line, you know, you come in well in advance of when you need to do it with a weather window, of course, to where it's going to burn, but not, you know, peter out, of course. Yeah. You have a start point and you always have an end point, right? You just don't go aimlessly throwing fire on the ground. No. <laughs> You're sometimes, you know, putting fire on the ground is actually a lot worse for the situation. There is such thing as too much fire. Yeah. Yeah. And they were doing too much fire for sure. For sure. a lot of room for improvement and that's not just relegated to your neck of the woods. I mean, that's no. across all walks of life and fire, whether that be pay standardization, uh, presumptive healthcare benefits, mental health. That's a big fucking one right yeah, there. That's a huge one. And it's really cool for me to see the improvements or the attempts at improvements mm -hmm. over here that are happening at the moment because we just don't have that back home at all. Mm -hmm. We have the EAP, which is 99% of the time not very helpful. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of it. There's no, there's nowhere external you can go for help and everyone kind of just chooses to ignore that it's a thing that happens it's and is happening. Yeah. Yeah. People yeah. are just like, it's like the elephant in the room that no one wants to talk about. Yeah. 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 And throughout all this, I, I became the elephant in the room that no one wanted to talk about and no one knew what to do anything with. And I was... really spiraling quite out of control, like internally after all of this and still is at this point, we still didn't have a suit. So I'm 
trying to deal with all of this and run the team and, you know, like train the rookies and sort of <sighs> trying to build a, a good foundation for when the soup did come in and not having any kind of support there. I just, I guess because of the stigma, just kind of ignored everything that was going on in my head. Yeah. And I was just getting more and more depressed and more and more anxious. And there was just more and more shit piling up on top of me that I couldn't handle. And at a point, it kind, it kind of felt like the big boss was just seeing how far he could push me before I fell over. And I, I ended up drinking quite a lot most nights after work to just try and make the rest of the day go away. And I was feeling like very, very intense suicidal thoughts. And I've had experience with depression in the past. So as I was like, oh, hi again. <laughs> it's not funny. <laughs> <laughs> the way you presented it was though. <laughs> um, but this time it was just getting, it was getting too much. And it was getting to a point where I didn't feel like I was in control anymore. I just kept on going to work every single day, head down, trying to make this shit work while spiraling into this kind of insanity. And it got to the point where my body just basically started not working anymore. It's going on like PT hikes and runs and I just for no reason would start like dry heaving even when I wasn't pushing myself that much. Yeah. And you're a stud as far as physicality <laughs> goes. I mean, you're obviously in shape. Yeah. 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 And I'd never had this before. Like even at my most unfit, I'm not a dry heaver. Mm -hmm. And yeah so I had I had that initially starting and then my body just started getting weaker and weaker and more and more sore until like my whole body was just literally in excruciating pain for no reason really but it was I, I think it was just my mental health and I'd wake up in the morning not wanting to be awake not wanting to go to work and I'd jump in the shower and start dry heaving in the shower as well at the thought of going to work. And I was sort of becoming so detached and so stuck down this like <sighs> rabbit hole that I was in. It was, it was like almost battling my subconscious that, did not want to be alive anymore and just driving to work was having to like kind of keep an eye on myself that I didn't veer into oncoming traffic and It was a very scary thing to feel so out of control of my mind and body. And one day it just got to the point I was at a prescribed burn and the new suit was there. He'd been around for a couple of weeks at this point. 
But by the time he turned up, I was just this ball of rage and <laughs> like probably not not particularly helpful to him. But I had spoken to him about how I was feeling and like I can't keep doing this shit. Like something's gotta change. Something's gotta change. Something's gotta change. Um and he was to his credit, he was really, really good about that. And I gave him a, you know, overview of what had sort of been going on for the past few years. And he told me he had no idea about it. I was like, oh shit. Sorry to bust that can of worms Sorry. open on you. <laughs> Welcome home, boss. Yeah. Um but yeah, one one day we're at a um prescribed burn and it was the middle of the afternoon. And I just, I didn't want to be there, which is very unlike me. Like burning is, burning is my thing. Yeah. I love burning. Great at it. Could just do it day and night. Anytime someone's like, Hey, you want to burn? I'm like, hell yeah. yeah let's do do I want to burn? <laughs> so I got, yeah. Halfway through this day. And I was like, I, I don't want to be here. I can't be here. And I went and told the soup that and just went home. And never went back to work. Like just could not do it. I spent days in bed, barely able to move. Just trying to get my head in. A good enough space that I could just face a day. I was trying to figure out what I was going to do from that point because, you know, you can't just <laughs> can't just lay in bed for the rest of your life and we didn't have any fires that season. I would I was basically just skipping out on the prescribed burn season so there's all my money that I could have made gone. And... <sighs> I was toying with the idea of joining the police force, but I decided that I kind of, I, I knew deep down that I love fire too much. I'm way too passionate about fire yeah. to leave it, but there was no way I was continuing to work at that organization and that agency I'd been in two separate districts where I'd had not great experiences. Um, so I decided to focus on getting over here and I just spent the next month or so laying in bed with my laptop, applying for any and every wildland fire job over here, just hoping that something would come of it. And kept getting knocked back because of my citizenship. And one night, I think it was about 3 a.m., I was just in such despair at this point of like what the hell I was going to do. And I decided to start looking at um, colleges despite my. I, I have something just in my head that makes me completely resistant to the idea of paying tens of thousands of dollars for someone to give me a piece of paper to tell me that I know how to listen and repeat information. <laughs> That's the best description of American higher education that I've ever fucking heard in my life. <laughs> but uh, I, you know, nonetheless decided this is potentially the only feasible way for me to get here and uh, decided to study a associate's degree in wildland fire behavior. And I applied, I think I had a week to put in my application and that was round up all my old school transcripts, get medical 
tests and all sorts of stuff done. So I was racing around doing this. Um, and got in and then st- had to go through the whole visa process, which was just, I can imagine that's fun. Oh, super fun. Yeah. 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 All sarcasm included. Oh yeah. <laughs> Particularly getting an exemption to leave the country. That was. Yeah. You guys got some wild COVID protocols. Down yeah. There. Yeah. Yeah. Super crazy. And that was what everything all hinged on. Like up to, I'd been granted my visa. Everything was good to go. Um, but I had to get an exemption to leave the country and I had to have all of my evidence lined up. So I had to have flights booked. I had to have, I've, you know, spent thousands of dollars at this point to potentially get knocked back yeah. from leaving the country. And it's not like you're going to get a refund on all that money. No. You're taking a huge gamble. Yeah. 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 And yeah. So I, I have to put in this exemption in the form of a, a stat deck and say, I'm going to be out of the country for this long, so I'm not going to be a threat to you. And if I return in, I think it's the next year, I will go to potentially go to jail for five years for yep, for coming home for perjury. Yep. That's for a coming home. Egregious, don't you think? It is. It is. Jesus, fuck. Yeah. Yeah. But nevertheless, that was part of what I had to do. So part of your healing process. Yeah. 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 Well, so now I'm here. You're stuck here too. I'm, I'm here. I'm stuck here. With <laughs> Literally. No guarantee of any work. <laughs> no guarantee any of this will work out. But I mean, I'm trying. <laughs> That's, that's all you can do. Yeah. That's all you can do. Um, yeah, I know, uh, that the, uh, citizenship as far as getting an appointment with the federal, uh, government, getting on any wildland firefighting crew federally, it's, it's a tall order if you're yeah. not a U.S. citizen. So if anybody's out there listening to this, looking at you audience, <laughs> um, help our girl out. She's got experience. I mean, it's in a different country, so things are going to be different. Of course, you're going to have to go through rookie school and all that stuff again. But, yeah. I'm happy to start at the bottom. Yeah. I, don't get me wrong. I would, if I were to get back into fire, I just want to be like a backseater last yeah. radio, not I'm, even a radio. Don't even give me a radio. <laughs> like give me a, like a monkey paw last tool, no yep. responsibilities. I'll just cruise. Yeah. <laughs> Having responsibilities <laughs> sucks. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm quite looking forward to basically just starting from the start again after having ridiculous amounts of pressure and responsibilities that shouldn't have been on me yeah. on me for so long. It'd be nice to just breathe and actually enjoy the job. Yeah. I mean, it's going to become it with its own stresses as well, but you know, yeah, you're familiar with that. Yeah. It's yeah. a job. Yeah. Yeah. And it's not an easy one by no. any means. No, no. So, yeah. Let's help our girl out here. That'd be great. <laughs> I'd really appreciate it. Yeah. I'll reach out to some folks, see if I got any uh, information for you too. That'd be yeah. awesome. Thank you. But yeah. It's a, it's one hell of a story. And I'm glad that you've had the courage to come on the show and tell your truth. Thank you. I, <laughs> I do feel like there's a lot of things that I've forgotten or skipped over or not told very well, but that's all right. It is what it is. <laughs> it's all good. So what's uh, moving forward for you looking like? <sighs> Finish the semester of college. Um, next one, a lot of my fire units will actually open up. So I didn't have any fire specific units available this semester. So It's all the hoops you got to jump through before you go to that stuff, yeah. the specialization portion. It's like, yeah. can you do the boring parts? Here's math. <laughs> if you can do that, then you can... Play with fire. But we didn't prove if you can spell the word the. (laughs) Here's an English class. Thank you. Yeah. So um, next semester in college and just hoping to hear back from someone about a job. I've applied everywhere, literally everywhere. (laughs) There we go. Well, hopefully it pans out. Yeah. I'm sure it will somehow, some way, whether that be with the feds or contract or state yeah. agency, 
yeah. plenty of options. There's and that's the other options. thing over here. There are options. We don't have uh, contract crews yeah. back home. So there's, yeah, there's a lot more sort of plan B, plan C's. Yeah, there's contingencies. Available, yeah. yeah. It's good. Options are good. Yeah. And as far as where we can find you on the old interwebs? Uh, Instagram at M Parnaby. I think that's about all I've got. <laughs> no Facebook. All right. You're like, I don't whoa, use one Facebook. Profile. Yeah. I've got it, but I, I never get on it. It's a toxic shit show of politics and people wanting to argue, like yeah. seek argument. And I just, yeah. I just use it to advertise my podcast. I'm hardly even on my own profile. Yeah. Like, yeah. I'll post a picture every once in a while, but yeah, I think I posted something, uh, when I moved over here, like nearly four months ago. <laughs> and that was the first thing I posted in like a year. Yeah. And it's probably the last thing I'll post for another year. There we go. Yeah. Facebook. Don't worry about it. Sorry. Meta. Whatever oh, it's yeah, called. Of course. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Rebranding. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. Um, yeah. So if we want to find you, that's M or E. Part e M. B. Yeah. E M. Part B. P A R N A B Y. On the old gram. Yeah. All right. Well, coming towards the end of the show. I always get, like to give the opportunity for you to give a uh, shout out to a homie, hero, mentor, a couple of them. Ooh. What do you got for us? Uh, shout out to Britt and Kate and Darcy, uh, old crewmates and very good friends of mine. Uh, massive shout out to my parents and my brother for supporting me through my big move and all of this and actually making it a feasible thing. <laughs> yeah. It's um, important to you. It's yeah. It's, it's good for your mental health. Yes. Yeah. Yes. You needed this. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> absolutely. Um, I mean, there's so many people I could shout out, but I, I think I might just leave it at that. <laughs> so I don't start getting into the nitty gritty and leaving people out. <laughs> All righty. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that's going to wrap it up for the show. But you know, I think there's a big, uh, big lesson to be had multiple different lessons to be had with this episode. And one is talking about it, talking about mental health, addressing the elephant in the room, and then, you know, doing what's right, what you need to do in order to heal. You've experienced a lot of shit. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, you're taking the steps to, to heal. Yeah. And I hope a lot more people will do that instead of will follow something similar to you as far as that healing process. Yeah. However, whatever it looks like. Yeah. And it looks completely different for everyone. You yeah. know, it's not a one size fits no. all solution. That's for sure. Not at all. Not at all. Yeah. Well, I'm glad you're doing good. Thank you. So am I. <laughs> <laughs> Look at that smiles. Yeah. <laughs> oh man. All right, ladies and gentlemen. Well, M, Emily. <laughs> Panabi. <laughs> Thanks for being on the show. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me on. Alrighty. Take care, everybody. See ya. And boom. There we go, ladies and gentlemen. Another episode of the Anchor Point Podcast is in the books with my good friend Emily Parnaby, all the way from Australia. Pretty interesting. And uh yeah, you know what? The true honor here goes to you. Um honestly, it takes so much so much courage to uh, get on the show and tell your truth like the way you did uh it's it's a heavy subject and i can understand uh how difficult that must have been for you but i i definitely definitely applaud you for that and i hope that all you folks out there that are listening to this podcast take a couple of notes and uh realize how real this whole wildland fire thing can get it's a very real subject and it uh, it's not just isolated to the United States. I mean, uh, people from all around the world deal with this as, as as proven today. So take notes, listen, and reflect on what it means to be a wildland firefighter. It's, things happen. Emily, once again, thank you very much for being on the show. Hopefully we can get you on here again. As for the rest of you, uh, enjoy your holidays, enjoy your Thanksgiving, enjoy your Christmas. I hope you enjoyed your Thanksgiving, but enjoy your Christmas. And uh, yeah, like I said earlier in the intro here, uh, tune into Grassroots and uh, share the word. They're uh, making moves up there on Capitol Hill, and it's pretty awesome. That being said, hope everybody's doing well. Take care. And a special shout out to our sponsors. We got Mystery Ranch, makers of the finest damn fireline packs in the wildland firefighting game. Mystery Ranch, built for the mission. If you want to go find out more, especially about their Backbone series and their scholarships, uh, scholarships it, 
associated with that. Go over to www.mysteryranch.com and check it out. We've got Hot Shot Brewery, kick-ass coffee for a kick-ass cause. If you guys uh, want to get your morning started off right and uh, get some some f- rather funny uh, holiday-themed t-shirts, well, go over to www.hotshotbrewing.com and check it out. We've got the ass movement, the poo bearing propaganda freaking awesome people also well, just one person but if you want to find out more about uh the ass movement and its funny name but seriousness about stewardship go to www.thefirewild.com and check out the ass movement and last but not least we got the smoky generation and uh it's a digital catalog of uh wildland fire firefighting stories dating all the way back to the 1940s and you can go over there to www.wildfireexperience.org it's awesome check it out bethany you have a kick-ass organization over there as for the rest of you y'all know the drill stay safe stay savage we'll see you on the next one peace